Good morning. I'm Leif Nelson, and thanks for coming to the Data Colada seminar series. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Jesse Single, and who is going to be joining us along with two panelists, Yoel Inbar and Alexa Tullett. In addition, uh, Yuri Simonson and Joe Simmons will be here with us today, as always. And for those of you who haven't been here before, you'll see at the bottom of your screen there is a Q&A function which enables you to submit questions or comments that will be seen by all of us. Uh, and we will read them uh, while Jesse is speaking or probably even when he's not speaking, and we will try to give voice to them uh, when we have a chance. Uh, and particularly for today, where Jesse's really hoping to sort of have an open conversation and respond to comments and questions from, from everybody, uh, keep it active. And we will try to give voice to as many of those as possible. OK, so uh, with that, I'm going to hand the floor over to you, Jesse. Hey, Leif, thank you so much for having me. Thank you to uh, everyone for tuning in. Um, I'm recording this from my Brooklyn apartment. My computer is four feet from a fire escape where pigeons often congregate. So if you hear cooing in the background, it's that. This came yesterday from, um, from Amazon, but we haven't set it up yet. Her name is Zelda. My girlfriend named her Zelda. And let me see if I can get this right. So it's supposed to, it's supposed to scare the pigeons away, but she hasn't been installed yet. Um, I basically just wrote a quick talk up. I, I think it's like 15 minutes. Um, you guys can feel free to interrupt me midstream because I, yeah, I do mostly want this to be a conversation. Um, so I'll just sort of uh, get to it, I guess. Uh, everyone can hear me okay, right? Okay. <clears throat> so I have been a journalist for about 15 years now. And uh, I look back on a lot of the stories I've written with, with a great deal of pride. Like I'm, I'm proud of some of my work. Uh, with some of my other work, that's not the case. And one story I do not look back on with pride was published uh, November 14th, 2014. That was about eight months after I began working as the editor of Science of Us, New York Magazine's behavioral science vertical. Uh, the story is still up and you can see it for yourself. It has the headline, white people think black people are magical. In it, I reported on the results of a social, psychological, and personality science study, which purported to detect a, quote, superhumanization bias, end quote, when it comes to white people's views of Black people, uh, the theory being white people associate Black people with superhuman abilities. The researchers came to that conclusion through an implicit association test. Uh, as I wrote at the time, quote, the researchers showed that whites are quicker to associate blacks than whites with superhuman words like ghost, paranormal, and spirit are more likely to think a black person as opposed to a white person has certain superhuman abilities, and that the more they think blacks are superhuman, the less they view black people as having a capacity to feel pain, end quote. A bit more than seven years later, I just don't trust this result at all uh, because I barely trust the implicit association test at all. I know that it's a noisy, unreliable instrument that can't really be trusted to tell us much about a given test taker uh, as the test's own creators have acknowledged. More broadly, I now have a much better sense of just how easy it is to cut statistical corners to generate supposedly meaningful results, and just how cluttered uh, the psychological research landscape is with highly questionable findings. Back in 2014, though, I, I didn't know about any of this, and I trusted the IIT. But learning about the shortcomings of that test sort of opened a door for me that led directly many, many years later to the publication of the, the book we're going to talk about today, The Quick Fix, Why Fad Psychology Can't Cure Our Social Ills. Um, my book exists in large part because while I was at New York Magazine, myself and my colleagues were firehosed with press releases from top universities and journals, basically trying to bait us into writing about their studies. I don't remember exactly the circumstances that led me to write the, the study I was just talking about, but it wouldn't surprise me if I saw the study on Eureka Alert, which is a service that you know drops a series of new study press releases customized to your own areas of interest in your inbox every morning at, uh, at 2 a.m. Uh, I'm still on there. I don't, I don't really read it as much. What probably happened was I saw the press release, skimmed the study, and then got a jolt of excitement when I envisioned the headline white people think black people are magical, because I knew it was likely to get page views. Uh, a lot of journalism these days comes down to writing a provocative attention getting headline. There's, there's so much competition for readers attention that getting that headline is at least half the battle. Um, 
so once I realized I could publish an article with that headline, human nature dictated I would probably not gaze upon the study itself with a particularly skeptical eye. That's how it goes for an unfortunately high percentage of science reporting. Uh, we are attention whores. We want people to click on our stuff. And that's one of the reasons half-baked science spreads. Uh, but of course, that's not the only thing going on here. We're in a golden age of half-baked viral behavioral science, or at least I hope I, we are, given that it's the thesis of my book. And that's the result of a confluence of many factors. One of them is definitely clickbait journalism. Journalists are overworked, underpaid, and, and often not really trained to report on social science, and the results are fairly predictable. But I also think there's a, a tendency on the part of society to presume psychological insights can solve a lot of problems we shouldn't really expect them to be able to solve. My book discusses the way power posing, for example, was woven into the conversation about the workplace gender gap, grit into the discussion of educational inequality, uh, the IAT naturally into the conversation about racism and so on. In each of these cases, there's a profound difference between what the experts were saying about the idea in question when it was at its TED Talk peak and, and what we now know to be true. Now, I, I can say with like some certainty that I, I think you can study racism in America in intelligent, important ways while ignoring the IAT entirely. And I think you can study educational inequality while ignoring grid entirely. Like I, I can't say for sure, but it wouldn't shock me if these ideas turned out to be totally marginal at best in the long run, despite how much conversational space they took up at their peak. So why do we fall for these ideas? I, I, part of it, and, and this is not something I could ever prove empirically, this is just my theory. Um, I just think America is very, very into individualism and self-help, and we always have been. So it shouldn't necessarily surprise us that theories which promote an individualistic self-help focused view of the world do so well in the marketplace of scientific ideas. We'd like to think that that marketplace is some sort of pure meritocracy, that it's untouched by all those normal icky factors we associate with domains of human life like politics or religion, but that's not true. I mean, we know it's not true. It's like any other market. Uh, and, and to a large extent, we adopt the scientific ideas we want to believe, those that reflect stuff we already believe and value. It would be super cool if you could address the gaps in the American educational system, which are cruel and fundamentally unjust. And, and in a sense, I want to say un-American. I mean, they are American because that's how we've always worked. But, you know, they're not what we want America to be. Um, it would be cool if you could address those with, with grit and with grit interventions. It would be super cool if a 10 minute computerized test could lend us credible insights about our implicit bias and that that alone could really chip away at inequitable structures that in some cases date back centuries. When it comes to pop science, we have a serious problem with wishful thinking. These issues are far more complicated than we're often led to believe and that you know journalists such as myself lead us to believe. Uh, people often don't wanna hear that, but that's the truth. There is a risk of, of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Um, often the ideas I critique in my book have a kernel or two of, of valuable truth to them. Think back to the white people think black people are magical story. Uh, that research was premised in part on the idea that white people don't take black people's pain as seriously as white people's or as seriously as they should. That's not an area I'm all that familiar with, but my sense is there is some solid research on that, on, on particularly for medicine where doctors don't uh, prescribe black people painkillers in the same way, and they don't they don't rate their pain as highly as they do white people's, and th that's terrible, and that's a really important finding. But the question is whether we should rely on an instrument like the IAT to teach us all that much about something like that, or to help us address it. And and I just don't think we should. Similarly, to, to go back to grit for a minute, it's not like grit doesn't measure anything. I mean, there's an argument to be made that it's basically measuring conscientiousness, but either way, it does seem to have some value as a predictor of success. The problem is the sheer gravity of the story we want to believe, that, that stick to itiveness or grit or conscientiousness matters much more than natural ability, ends up warping the research and our storytelling about it. When you look closely at the grit data, it was only in the most specific, often very range restricted settings that it could make any claim to beating out traditional measures of ability as a predictor of success. And that, that tiny little finding, which is you know interesting, but maybe not that important, was blown up into TED Talk superstardom to the point of grit becoming you know, basically a household term across America, at least among sort of book buying types. 
it's not just society at large uh, that is seduced by these ideas. Uh, and this is sort of my last point I wanna make, um, but individual institutions themselves. The obvious example there is the implicit association test. If you're a manager at some company and you're tasked with doing something about diversity by your bosses who don't in fact care about diversity, but who wanna make it seem like they do, then what better way to take that off your list than to purchase a pre-packaged training centered on the IAT? And once there's a roaring market for something like the IAT, then of course it's going to be harder for critics of it to gain much traction. Um, here's what the, the wonderful social psychologist Carol Tavris told me on, on this subject, and I, I was thrilled I was able to include this whole quote in my book. Once you have committed yourself to a theory, and this is true of any of us, it becomes hard to accept criticisms of that theory, let alone evidence that you might be wrong about it. Scientists are not immune to this inclination, even though the whole nature of the scientific enterprise is to put your beliefs to the test. Is this what's going on here? And see if the evidence supports it or not. But if you have also taken your theory into the public forum, you are now getting thousands upon thousands of dollars to educate people in companies and the government about your test, your measure, or your hugely popular idea, you now have a vested interest financially, emotionally, and psychologically in its being right. How easy is it going to be for you to say, maybe I went too far, maybe I ignored the parts that didn't fit. Maybe this idea sounded appealing, but it has a few problems I didn't anticipate. That, in terms of research and science, is the greatest danger of this tedification phenomenon, the impulse to oversimplify and cut around the edges. Um, I, I think this is all true of the IAT, and I've been pleased to see some criticisms of it catch on since I first wrote about it in 2017. But for the most part, it, it still seems to be going strong in a way that, that suggests what Carol told me is true. It, it's shocking how little the debunking of that test has filtered down to the general public or to, to the institutions that use it. Um, but perhaps the most disturbing example of an institution falling in love with an undercooked psychological theory comes from the army. One of my book's chapters is about comprehensive soldier fitness, which is a program designed to prevent PTSD that the army adopted in 2009 in the wake of a, a horrific uptick in PTSD and in suicides uh, that was largely centered on veterans who had returned home from Iraq and Afghanistan. <clears throat> CSF, Comprehensive Soldier Fitness, was sold to the army by Martin Seligman, the positive psychology godfather, former president of the APA, and founder and head of the Positive Psychology Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he and his colleagues adapted a program originally created in the 1990s, the Penn Resilience Program, which is a cognitive behavioral intervention that was designed to reduce depression and anxiety symptoms in 10 to 14 year old kids. They adapted it uh, to form a large component of what would become comprehensive soldier fitness. I'm going to skip the details of what's in the Penn Resilience Program. It's just there's all sorts of stuff online. It's easy to find if you're curious. Uh, what matters here is that there are always numerous issues with the idea of adapting PRP to a military setting. Perhaps most basic is the question of whether anyone should expect a program designed to prevent anxiety and depression in 10 to 14 year olds in everyday settings to prevent PTSD and suicide in 20 year olds in combat zones. Calling that a leap seems to be an understatement. There's also the question of PRP's own effectiveness. One meta-analysis co-authored by the program's uh, founder or creator, Jane Gillum, found that while the program had statistically significant effects along some measures, they were small and may not have been clinically significant. None of this has stopped the Penn Resilience Program, um, or sorry, the Penn's Positive Psychology Program from marketing PRP as an important positive psychology intervention. It's worth noting that Gillum herself doesn't consider it to even be a positive psychology intervention. It's, it's more cognitive behavioral, but um, not that the two are totally separate, but uh, Seligman and his Positive Psychology Center are selling the PRP to schools and other institutions all over the world, touting it as quite effective, despite the fact that there isn't great evidence for it. So back to the Army, what happened in short was the Army took what appears to be a marginally effective program at best for reducing anxiety and depression in middle schoolers and adapted it to a very different setting without any pilot testing. And, and Seligman, to his credit, says in one of his books that he wanted there to be pilot testing, but that the military was so impressed with the Penn Resilience Program's track record with its numerous replications that it decided to forge ahead because it was facing such a crisis. This is a real misunderstanding of the evidence base for PRP, though. There was effectively no evidence it could do what the Army was asking it to do because no one had really tested it. 
uh, as a means of preventing PTSD or suicide. It also appears Seligman wasn't working from an accurate understanding of PTSD. In one of the papers he co-authored with colleagues, uh, they wrote that the preventative effects of the Penn Resilience Program on depression and anxiety are relevant to preventing PTSD, since PTSD, this is a direct quote, is a nasty combination of depressive and anxiety symptoms. In other words, if you can treat or prevent depression and anxiety, you can treat or prevent PTSD. But while it's true that having PTSD can lead you to develop depression and anxiety symptoms, that, that doesn't mean treating or preventing depression or anxiety can treat or prevent PTSD automatically. That's like saying curing a cough will necessarily cure the underlying illness causing it. It's just, to me, it's a misunderstanding of how this stuff works. Um, despite these very serious questions, comprehensive soldier fitness became a mandatory part of army life. Uh, and it has been so for more than a decade now. We don't have an exact price tag, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood of $500 million. It might be the most expensive targeted mental health program in human history, though I definitely can't say that for sure. I find it to be a remarkable worst case example of what can happen when half-baked psychology catches on among powerful people who have a lot of money to throw around. Uh, and on that cheerful note, maybe we will uh, can open it up to conversation. Uh, Jesse, thanks a lot. That was that was really great. I uh, I've read the book and I I, I really love it. So uh, I highly recommend it to the audience here. Um, so lots of questions. Uh, one question from Dorothy Chronic uh, came in that I think is really interesting. She she asked, "Do you think the incentives to tedify research in social psychology are related to the incentives that occasionally generate outright fraud, as in the Bacor case that you reported on a few years ago, or do you view these as like two distinct problems?" It, I think they're cousins at least i mean the, you guys are have to generate novel findings that are publishable in big journals right and and those are the findings that get written up in ted talks i think um luckily not that many humans are capable of outright fraud just in terms of sort of the moral build of their brain i think everyone you know, at least in 2010, everyone was capable of, of p-hacking and doing other stuff that's straddles that line where it's like either unintentional or just like in this fuzzy liminal space. I have a sort of related question. Sorry, Joe. Um, I have a related question to that. So as you were talking about the sort of um, the incentives that journalists face. So I've thought a lot about the incentives that scientists face um, and how we can better align the incentives with, with the work that scientists are doing. And in some ways that doesn't seem like completely infeasible to sort of like get journals to change um, what they are willing to publish. And then, you know, scientists are, are rewarded for their publications and things like that. I mean, there are obvious problems. It's not, it's, it's not simple by any means. But when I think about the, the pressures that journalists face, I wonder if it's an entirely different beast. So when you describe, you know, uh, being attention whores and, and trying to generate these uh, headlines and stories that are going to get the attention of the public, is there, I mean, is there a solution to that? Like, how do we uh, align the incentives of, you know, uh, communicating accurate science um, findings to the public with, the public's interest in things that are surprising and novel. Yeah, so so my book comes down pretty positively on on the future of psychology and, and social psychology in particular, just because I think you guys have built like the start of, of infrastructure for changing or fixing a lot of the problems. Um, it's there at least for people who want to take advantage of it. Uh, journalism, I, I honestly have no hope that science reporting um, is going to improve because all of our problems are getting much worse. Everything I mentioned is getting worse. There's no incentive to get stuff right. W when I see what gets published in the, you know, I'm, I'm a generalist, but I know about a few different areas, you know, and, and when I see what gets published in major outlets, it's just astonishing. And that suggests what gets published in scientific areas I don't know about is astonishingly wrong also. So um, I have no good news to report on on that front. I do think it would help if if press releases were written in a more responsible way and if there were sort of internal social and professional pressure in private among social psychologists not to be that person who takes their weak study and presents it as stronger than it is to the to the public or to journalists because I, I don't think journalists are going to be able to resist it unfortunately. I hope that changes but I, I just don't see any positive signs. Yeah, so to follow up on that, uh, you talked a bit about the incentives that journalists face. I was just curious, what sort of 
training in research methods, stats, like critical analysis of a set of findings does the typical journalist who's writing about this stuff have? Do they have the, the knowledge that's necessary to sort of look under the hood a bit and see whether a, a set of findings is reliable or not? Uh, the average journalist does not. And, and I rely a great deal on sort of more statistically intelligent people to explain even fairly basic problems to I me. Mean, I'm not great at stats, but I can at least, I understand the basics. I can read a regression table. Most journalists don't have that training. I was lucky I got to go to, I went to grad school in public policy, like a quant heavy program. Um, so I, I got the basics. No, I, so there's fewer and fewer sort of beat reporters who just write about science anyway. Like a lot of times what happens is you write about everything and then, oh, the implicit association test is a big deal. You're gonna write a story or two about that or grid is a big deal. And you see in a lot of like, uh, I don't wanna name specific outlets but a lot of coverage sort of fall uh, falls victim to that. So no, most journalists don't have training. I, you know, there's some pros at this. Uh, there's beat reporters at the Times who of course can do that well. There's Daniel Angber who I think is at, um, uh, the Atlantic recently. I often name mention Stephanie Lee. She's she's a younger reporter at BuzzFeed who I think does a great job on this stuff. So, I mean, that's one thing researchers can do is search out the the journalists who are doing it well and and try to sort of foster relationships with them. Um, and you know, I hate to say it, but part of the way this whole thing works is if you think a colleague of yours is doing something shitty, send an email to a journalist. It can even be anonymous. Just be like, I sort of got tipped out to the the IAT thing. Um, we're not exactly talking someone passing me documents in a Washington DC parking lot in, in like a briefcase, but it was literally just someone emailing me being like, this, the evidence for this is weak, you should look into it. So that that helps a huge uh, amount. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known that otherwise, or it would have taken me much longer to catch on. So if you're gonna give a member of the public advice, is the advice to just ignore all pop science journalism? Yeah, I mean, I'd be comfortable saying, I, I, yeah, I mean, I'd be curious what you guys think. If they, if you had to choose either ignore all pop science journalism or believe all pop science journalism, I think on net, you'd be better ignoring it. The problem is you can't really give simple guidelines. I, I definitely don't think you should trust any individual study at this point, unless you know that it was, you know, pre-registered or know about the sample size or whatever. I, I would say people should ignore a huge amount of pop science reporting, except for mine, which is always accurate. When I was first, um, when I, first met my girlfriend, uh, I was trying to explain to her like what I did and what I'm interested in. And um, her takeaway was like, okay, so I should just distrust all social psychology. And I was like, yes, I guess pretty much. Um, yeah. So given the dichotomy that you presented, I would choose distrust everything. Um, but so I, I also feel like I've sort of like peddled this message um, in my department and with my students and maybe more broadly than that as well. Um, but the, the time when I start to question that message is, so, so Naomi Oreskes has writes about these sort of merchants of doubt and things like that, right? And how this like sort of fostering doubt um, in an entire scientific enterprise or in science itself um, can have this nefarious outcomes, especially if motivated people are, are cultivating doubt. Um, so I guess I'm just like curious as somebody who's writing about this, how do you avoid um, making everybody into nihilists or something like that? Or are you even trying to avoid that? Like, <laughs> I, 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 I guess I run into the same problem and I'm wondering how you deal with it. Yeah, the, uh, the big Lebowski trap. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's so hard. And, and part of the problem is also that, that sort of opportunistic thing flows in the other direction too. Because one of the things that slowed down the debunking of the implicit association test was like, I mean, you had pretty big name researchers basically saying, well, you know, that's interesting that you're so concerned with debunking this tool that's so crucial for fighting racism. It's almost like you don't care about fighting racism. And I've seen that in other areas too, where people sort of fend off critiques of their work with politicized arguments. Um, I don't want people to be nihilist. I, I think discussing science reform and covering what science reform looks like is a good way for people to understand how science works and how it should work and why good science they should believe in. And um, I, do, I just don't want people, I think I fell into this trap back in the day to, I don't want people to think that a scientific claim is like, has some sort of inherent glow to it that should make it more trustworthy. I think the more people understand the sociology of science and the ways it's conducted and how human an institution it is, we'll all be better off. But but I share your concern because I, I, 
after writing this book, like part of me, frankly, doesn't really want to write that much more about psychology because I, I, I just don't have any faith that anything I write about in a positive way will be true five years from now, which is not, is not a good feeling. So on that uh, question from Gal Zagerman, um, he asks, isn't it important to distinguish false from true, but can't solve the problems that we wanted to solve or can't live up to maybe some of the most enthusiastic claims that are made in the media? So, so I would put the implicit association test in this kind of category of, you know, it's a very general technique for mapping on average, what do people associate with what? I would say there's definitely scientific value to it as a solution to racism in the US, well, that's more questionable, right? And I guess the implicit accusation that Gall's making here is that you're sort of conflating those two things. You're saying just because it can't live up to uh, the kind of lofty hype that it's received, that there's no value to it whatsoever. Yeah, I, th I, I mean, that that's a potentially fair accusation. I guess I would just turn it around and say like, um, and I, he doesn't, or she doesn't need to answer this directly now, but what exactly does the IIT do? Other than I've heard people say like it's vaguely, it's an educational instrument, which I've always said, if I give you a depression test that doesn't actually tell you how depressed you are accurately, and then you're like, this is inaccurate. I'm like, well, it's just an educational tool. That's not, that's, I haven't really heard an explanation of exactly what utility the test has now that those lofty claims have been knocked down a bunch. Uh, I think with the IIT, the risk, and, and I often hear this from political conservatives is, oh, the IIT doesn't work, therefore implicit bias isn't important. That, and that is a mistake because that doesn't follow at all. Like if a, if a thermometer is broken, it doesn't mean temperature isn't an important concept. Um, I think implicit bias probably has effects around the edges. I mean, it sort of has to given how human brains work. It's just, if you, if you look seriously into something like uh, housing discrimination or intergenerational poverty, the idea that this is the result of just split second decisions rather than these complicated overdetermined, I, I just, I don't buy it. And I worry that it has unintended political consequences of imagining we can tweak our way out of um, problems that, that require some like really heavy lifting. Do, do you think there's parts of psychology or any part of psychology where you th or even even just individual findings where you think that researchers should feel comfortable giving advice to policymakers based on based on the research. I mean, there's this. You sort of end the book with this um, discussing Hans Eisenman, Neil Lewis's, and Samin Vazir et al.'s paper about using caution when applying behavioral science to policy, and they're basically like, whoa, 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 we need to slow down here and not be giving so many so many prescriptions. But do you think that like one view, and I. I think I've heard Samina espouse this view on uh, Yoel's podcast is like, we really shouldn't be, it's a very extreme position. We really shouldn't be giving any advice to anyone. But I think there's another view that's like, well, maybe there's some areas of psychology that are more healthy than others. And maybe there are, there are places where we can still contribute. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think like, um, you know, I have a chapter on nudging and where I basically come down is like, when you look at all, my senses, a lot of like the Kahneman Tversky classic stuff has, has held up a lot of the basic principles. The problem is just because it, it holds up as a basic principle, does that mean it will work in a given intervention? And a lot of the times, not a lot of the times, sometimes nudges don't work. That's a good example of where like, you know, a psychologist should tell people, let's say if a firm wants to save paper, should we constantly remind people they should be good to the environment or should we just default to double-sided paint uh, printing? You should default to double-sided printing. The problem is, I think I'm stealing this from someone, but it's like the more confident you can be about a claim within psychology, the less exciting it is. Um, so it's not particularly exciting to say, defaulting to double-sided paper is important. On the other hand, like we just weren't doing that for a while. Um, I, I also write up a story about a the summon system in New York, the tickets you would get for, for public drinking, uh, which I did get one a couple summers ago. And they were just designed so poorly. They were designed in a way where, where someone with a Kahnemanian training would have instantly be like, no, cross this out, put this here. But, and, and it made a real difference to redesign that form. The bigger difference was they stopped, um, they, they dismantled the system where you can affect, uh, potentially go to jail for urinating in public. That wasn't just a tweak of the ticket system that was actually changing the law, which is always going to be more important. So um, 
I think I sometimes ramble when I don't have a clean, good answer, but I think there are some psychological principles we can apply, but uh, my book is about the really big lofty ones. I don't think anyone could deny that there've been a lot of lofty claims lately. I wonder, so I'm always sort of like disappointed that um, my friends who are not psychologists are not as scandalized as I am when I tell them how weak evidence for power posing is. So like, I expect them to be like, what? Um, you know, you've like devastated my belief in this idea. And I actually know a lot of people who, who do, have been exposed to the idea of power posing and believe it. Um, and their, their response is often like, well, how harmful is this idea? And, and I see all of the, like, all of your points about, you know, money being wasted and opportunity costs and, and things like that. But I wonder what you think about um, the possibility of disentangling people's just sort of like, like ideas from the legitimacy that, that they get by being connected to empirical science. So what would you think of a system where we just had some people who were like, I think I have a cool idea and I'm going to give a TED talk about this, but I'm, I'm going to separate it from saying that it's, you know, it's empirically backed by, by science. Yeah. I mean, that, that's like a lot of the well, it's like a lot of the self-help industry is stuff that ideas that people find useful, but that might not have scientific evidence behind them. Um, you know, some people read The Secret and they think that they can visualize a new car and that the universe, the law of attraction will eventually pull them a new car. I, I find that just like offensive in certain ways on so many levels. I guess I should separate that out from whether maybe some people derive meaning or comfort from it. I, I just... I guess there's a difference between sort of like something that feels like outright dishonesty or that it could really lead someone astray and, and cause them to misunderstand the chances of them getting a new car versus just like, if someone wants to stand with their hands on their hips for, for a minute, as long as they understand there's not great scientific evidence for that. Um, some of these ideas I think are harmless. I think they run the gamut in my book from mm -hmm. power posing to the army spending hundreds of millions of dollars on, on a useless intervention. So uh, two questions in the chat that I'm going to ask uh, together, because I think they both have to do with institutions in different ways. Uh, so first of all, Chris Chabri asks, the desire of leaders in all kinds of organizations to proceed with untested interventions as though they all are already guaranteed to work is a huge problem. Have you come across any examples of leaders being convinced to back down and allow a proper field experiment before making a psychology-based intervention universal? And then Dana Carney asks, do we think the media and the sciences can do anything to push TED towards making sure what they feature is sufficiently replicated? So I'll just throw both of those at you. Uh, I do not know, that's interesting. I mean, institutions that are not adopting these interventions or are backing off from them, we're, we're less likely to hear about. And I was obviously less likely to seek out those stories in a book about how this is a big problem. I'm, I'm sure there's examples of that. One of the things I'm hoping my book does is empower people in the PTA meeting or in their company to just, just be like, um, excuse me, like there, can we just talk about whether there's evidence for this thing we're spending good money on? Um, it's interesting that that question came from Dana Carney about the TED talk, because if you go to Amy Cuddy's power posing thing, Ted has in fact added a little note about the limitations to the evidence. I think it would be great for them to do that. Of course, they're sort of a business and, and there needs to be some balance there where I'm not sure we should, it's reasonable to expect every single one of every sentence of one of their talks to be scientifically backed. But um, I mean, I would, I just, you know, I, I think we should push for accountability in general. And I, I know that within your field, there's been some controversy of like, mean tweets and blog posts, ridiculing researchers, methodological terrorism and all that. But we do respond to, to social incentives. And I don't think it's bad on balance is if, if you say something that is false, a bunch of people point that out. And my sense is 20 or 30 years ago, you could say something false and, and you know, maybe a letter would get published or, or a response article, but that would have to go through a bunch of gatekeeping. So I think changing those norms is important. I mean, I, I think Dana, I, I'm not sure what exactly she thinks about this, but it does seem like as the, you know, quote unquote experts, we do, we have some leverage, particularly with institutions like TED, where yeah, it's good for TED if talks make big kind of like attention grabbing and splashy claims, but it's bad for TED if everybody thinks that it's just made up BS, right? Like, so they do have some kind of just self-interested motivation, 
to to be seen as somewhat trustworthy, right? And like I'm wondering, like what you know, how can we use our power to sort of make that salient to them or make that more of a consideration? I guess. Yeah, I mean, you just you got to be louder, right? Because they, when you talk about a TED talk that gets 15 million views, the vast majority of those people are not gonna come to a seminar like this or, or be that skeptical. There's a huge market for you know, pseudoscience. So yeah, being loud is important. It'll change their calculus about which, which talks they want to publish. I should also say that the, the best way to solve this problem would be to give me a TED talk, obviously. So they should really consider that. Why in some of these cases doesn't, I mean, you've touched on this throughout, but just want to ask it more directly. Like why doesn't the debunking sort of break through in at least some of these cases? Like, I think it would be, a, it's got to be a sexy headline if like the IAT doesn't, doesn't actually work like you would think it would be sexy enough like why doesn't some of the debunking of high profile things actually you know get through it's crazy and, and the IIT is a great example yeah I mean those stories do debunking stories do do well um I, I think once like not to sound like a pinko but once like capitalism has really sunk its fangs into something and there's a huge cash incentive to continue to believe it uh, it shouldn't surprise us. So, you know, the IAT just got a really glowing treatment on one of the big morning shows a month or two ago. Um, I want to say good morning, America. It could be the other one. I don't, I don't watch them. I just saw it online. Uh, a huge amount of people make money from the IAT now. It, it's not as simple as that. It's also, we want to believe it. It's a tidy story. It, it, it makes um, white liberals who buy a lot of books feel like we can really be a part of the solution in a visceral way. It's almost this like spiritual search. And in my chapter on it, I tie that into other sort of attempts to spiritualize the quest for racial justice, which I find to be very pernicious and a distraction and, and narcissistic. I, yeah, I don't have a good answer. I've just found it incredibly frustrating because this isn't, to me, it isn't really a close call whether or not we should be having individual people take this test and giving them the results unless we, unless we couch it so much or hedge it so much that, that the results are sort of meaningless. Mm. Follow-up question on the IAT um, from Keith Maddox, who says, I'm curious where you got the idea that people are framing implicit bias as the bias that explains all forms of discrimination. Is this consistent with how it's portrayed in the media? I'd consider it a component of stereotyping prejudice and discrimination and an important component in a wide variety of contexts, but I guess implicit, not the only or perhaps the most important thing. Yeah, I, so that's partly how it was framed by... Um, Mazarin Banaj and Anthony Greenwald, uh, in either their book or one of their papers or both, they basically said that given the survey showing explicit bias was going down and given the clear, obvious continuing existence of racial bias, implicit bias could be seen as potentially more important than explicit bias. That was their claim. What I try to break down that dichotomy a little bit in my chapter, because I think there's a lot of forms of racial discrimination that don't require any ongoing bias to exist. Um, I use the example of just, I, I was born outside Boston and I grew up in a very white suburb and the structure of the Boston school system and the urban landscape was completely shaped by racism at a time when it was uh, either legal or much easier to just keep black kids in some schools and let white kids in other schools. Uh, the idea that 50 or 60 years later, we're not still feeling that effect uh, is silly, as is the idea that you couldn't have a situation where like everyone has the right attitudes, but just money and power flow in certain ways to, to continue uh, those discrepancies. So um, I, I agree with what, what Keith is saying. I don't, I don't want to sort of straw man anyone, but I think uh, Greenwald and Banaji were pretty clear in saying they think implicit bias could be more important than explicit bias. Um, I, I'd sort of, I guess I'll table my views on that just because I, I think people sort of miss the point when they think that a discriminatory outcome requires discrimination in the moment. I also think it's it's interesting to me that anyone makes that claim these days because I, I thought Michelle Alexander sort of demolished that. Um, her book came out, what, 10 or 15 years ago now, but yeah. Right, uh, just one follow-up, and I think you alluded to this already, um, implicit bias doesn't equal the IAT, right? So you can have criticisms of IAT, the method or the tool that don't, mm, don't necessarily speak to the, importance or lack of it of implicit bias in producing social outcomes right yeah 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 um one of the big uh 
I want to say Newsday did this big housing investigation on Long Island, just showing that, you know, as it's been forever, Black families and white families are just routed to different neighborhoods by real estate agents. And I, I think it's hard to imagine a situation where that isn't some combination of explicit and implicit bias, especially if you envision implicit bias as you see someone and it triggers certain associations, and that sort of sends you down this set of like cognitive pipes instead of this one, um, where you, ju you just need that, that triggered at first, setting you in a whole different direction, and then you justify it by saying, oh, they'd be a better fit there or whatever. So I, I absolutely think implicit bias is part of the story. I just think it's ridiculous how much time we spend thinking and talking about it, given that no one has come close to proving that it's that big a deal versus all the stuff where, where we know where the problems lie. So I've been thinking about like what, we've talked a lot about the journalism sort of piece of this, and, and maybe this is the wrong question to ask, but like kind of thinking like who's to blame for all of this? Like, is it the journalist or is it the scientist? Because it, at some level, the journalists, obviously they can pick and choose among the scientists in terms of what to report and they have their own incentives about picking, you know, clickbaity type things. But at the end of the day, a lot of these journalists are merely believing what the scientists themselves tell them. Yeah. And I think we have been in a golden age of, like you said, of, of scientists kind of embracing these kinds of quick fixes. So like, what has, what happened? Like wh why on earth has, have scientists done this? What are all the forces? I mean, clearly we know, you've talked about some of them, like there's clearly incentives to do this, like scientists can get, can get fame in universities and, and, and universities like that. And they yeah. afford that. Um, but I was wondering, you know, what are sort of the totality of the forces that might be driving that in the hopes that we can try to, you know, reverse engineer something that, that tries to fix it on our end as scientists? Yeah, I I could uh, I could definitely be wrong about this uh, and so much else. I, I I think it's a confluence of like around the turn of the century is when like the internet really hit. Maybe a little bit later, social media hit later. That's also when, in my view, um, phrasing this diplomatically, certain subfields of social psychology perhaps made claims that in retrospect were insane and that never should have caught on in the first place. That happened. TED Talks came on board. There was the whole sort of, um, you know, a certain genre book that I think really caught on, like early, early after the turn of the century. Um, that all happened, uh, and and it just there became a really big market for psychological science that I, I just don't think really existed in the '90s. I mean, I think people are always interested in psychology. I'm not sure. In, in the last part of the 20th century, we had had that much of this idea of the social psychologist as a thought leader getting up on the TED stage with a new intervention that can really help solve uh, a complicated problem. My book's sort of more speculative thesis is also, um, I use this framing, uh, there's a book called Age of Fracture by Daniel Rogers, a Princeton historian that I love. And his basic argument is that there was a time when America, uh, Americans' conceptions of themselves and, and of ideas had to do with really being embedded in these big social structures and in civic institutions, in religions, uh, neighborhoods. And you know that doesn't mean that we would want to go back to the 60s in many ways, because it was obviously worse for many groups in many ways, but his argument is that we've become more fractured. In, in many ways, Americans understand themselves as just sort of free floating atoms getting batted around by market forces. And it's everyone's goal to sort of look out for themselves and to optimize themselves in the marketplace. And, and to me, that, that really fits with a certain brand of social psychology where all these big forces recede into the background and, and social priming to me is like, is most guilty of this because you, this idea that, you know, you, um, Someone, someone gets flashed an American flag and it, it makes them much more patriotic or flash money and it makes them much more greedy. I know some of these cute lab effects are probably real, but, but we know so much about why people are patriotic or why they're greedy. It does have to do with these like big roiling forces and with their social networks, but just psychology has pulled off this trick or, or some fields of it where all that other stuff just fades into the background. All that matters is cute new lab study. And that new lab study can explain a lot. And um, I think that's the problem is often that cute lab study can explain very little. That was another rambling answer. Does that, does that get at what you were? Yeah, yeah it does. Just to, just to follow up. I mean, one of the main lessons of your book, of course, is that a lot of these big societal problems are going to be solved by 
big societal interventions, changing laws, um, changing policies, things like that. Um, but if psycho there's a lot of people who enter the field of psychology, I think probably more now than before, who do it because they, they want to change the world. They want to make the world kind of a better place. And the problem is that in psychology, if, if you wanna make it as a psychologist, you need to do individual level interventions. Like that's what we do for a living. Like we, we can't randomly assign different, different societies to be to have this structure versus that structure. Like what we do, it's, it's not only that we like individual level interventions because we're American or something, and that's the culture we grew up in. I think we also just need to use inter, individual level interventions because that's, that's the only way we can run proper experiments. And so to me, I, I don't know if this is just a comment, but to, to me, it makes me a bit pessimistic then about psychologists' ability to, if individual level interventions don't do a whole lot, then maybe we shouldn't be in the business of trying to change the world in some very meaningful way. Maybe there's improve the world, you know, through, through nudge-like interventions that that makes something go from 30% to 32%, and that's, that's fine. But it sort of seems to me like maybe we need to give up on the idea of using psychology and, or any, any behavioral sciences that focus on the individual in order to solve these big problems. Do you agree with that? Or? Um, I don't think you need to give up. I, this is one of those questions I feel a little bit underqualified to answer, but I don't have the intuition you should give up. There's a lot of, there's some interesting history of social psychology I had to uh, snip out of my book for space. And a lot of that has to do with how um, around World War II, there are all these really interesting interdisciplinary collaborations. You would often have social psychologists working with anthropologists and working with sociologists. And uh, in, I think it was like late 50s, early 60s, I probably have the dates wrong, somewhere in there, social psychology really started to set itself apart and professionalize itself as like, no, we're different from those other guys. And that came through experimentation. And there's this great stat I saw somewhere about how the percentage of social psych papers that involved experimentation went from, you know, 20% uh, to 80% or something profound like that. And it, the idea that I am going to go into a lab and produce data by in, uh, experimenting on individuals, that became like really intertwined with that sense of what it means to be a social psychologist. So I think there's something to maybe questioning that and figuring out other ways social psychologists can be. I also, um, one of my favorite positive results I wrote up that I don't think it, I end up mentioning in the book, but like, uh, uh, Betsy Pollock's like anti-bullying intervention, which is to my mind based on a sophisticated understanding of social norms. Uh, that to me is like, is where social psychology could really do some good. It, it, it isn't, doesn't strike me as outrageous that a social psychologist could go to a school and say, you're doing anti-bullying wrong. You're doing anti-drug stuff wrong because we know school administrators don't know what they're doing. They don't benefit from any knowledge of psychology. So, um, you know, Pollock's case is, is tricky because she's she's a brilliant researcher and she did field work in Africa and she's done all sorts of stuff that maybe a, a, the average 28 year old researcher can't do but I just think um I don't know I think there, there's a way for you guys to help especially when your book is when your work is actually undergirded by theory because when you when you try to understand her anti-bullying intervention and like you can really build it from the ground up it's like oh yeah we look around at what our peers are doing and we have cues from them and then maybe we won't step in to stop bullying versus like the worst of social priming. Oh, I look at this statue and it makes me much less religious because there's no like actual theory there. So I think um, that was yet more, more rambling as the hour reaches a close, but hopefully that was helpful. I, it's interesting that you entered that response by talking about theory, Jesse, because as you were talking, I was like, yes, the answer is that we all just do applied research. Like we just like find one sort of domain where we might be able to solve a specific problem that's like actually tangible and for, I mean, maybe you're, it's informed by theory. I'm, I don't really care about that part, um, but like at least it's really targeted. And I guess in response to what Joe was saying and also the, you know, this like, I mean, some of Talia Arconi's ideas about generalizability and also the paper that people were mentioning earlier about sort of applying our research to COVID. Sometimes I wonder if the answer is to move in a more applied direction and rather than try to sort of like address 
what human beings are like to try to, um, like you say, go to a school and be like, hey, how, how can we make anti-bullying work better? And I think experimentation could play an important role in that and the skill sets that we have could play an important role in that. But I'm increasingly skeptical about our ability to, to yeah, to, to address these broader questions. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think, I don't know, my, my point of view is you guys, you people have, have suffered major setbacks, I, I don't know, in, in your credibility. And you need to start from a, a more humble, like what exactly can we do to help place? I know not everyone agrees with that and people might find that uncharitable, but that's my view. I I have so, a, uh, sorry, go ahead. Do you think, sorry, change topics a little bit, but I, I'm, I'm wondering, and this applies to a few questions. Do you have a sense of the, the, the reader who, who reads a, a newspaper article about science what it is they're consuming because but part of me feels that it's it's mostly entertainment so they so it like basically is, is it closer to professional advice or to the horoscope section where <laughs> like 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 if he has some plausibility of truth it's enough for them to entertain the idea and, and they hold it in their minds for a little bit and then they, they have a nice story to tell a cocktail party but it doesn't really inform their life in any meaningful way in which case it's it's not really a root cause, like scientific journalism is not the root cause of the army having gone nuts with, right. with the, the intervention. Or are people really sort of, like what's your sense? You probably have a sense of that because you, you've you been serving that market, right? So. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it depends. I, I do think like what most of us want when we read the news is like something to share with friends or like some nugget to tell them that we like to talk about what we've read with people. So a huge amount of it is like, just, um, oh, you know, did you hear that uh, grit is actually more important than SAT scores? It's just like a sort of meme of information that that spreads. Um, but I, I, you know, in my book, I, I do talk about how I think as sort of precarity has crept up the income ladder, like everyone really does feel like need, they need to take advantage of every possible insight they can. And I think that partly explains something like grit, where it's not just like, this is a cool story I'm going to share with my friends, but, um, you know, look at sort of tiger mom discourse and how desperate parents are to give their kids every possible advantage. I, I think people really do believe this stuff in the sense that it might help them gain that extra um, extra edge they need to succeed. So I, I do think it's a little bit of both. And there's there's maybe sort of just sort of recreational science readers who, who really just want cool nuggets to share with friends, but then there's a huge market for self-help and, and the uh, combination of social psych and self-help uh, I think is, is an important story. So uh, a couple of questions about field studies here. Uh, Julia Minson, I'm just gonna paraphrase talked about the difficulty of getting partner organizations interested in doing uh, a field study at all. So either she says they're not interested because they think the idea is boring or they love it and therefore they just want to deploy it to everybody and don't see the need to do the RCT. Um, so she wants thoughts from you or any of us on how we sell this message that we need to collect data, we need to randomly assign people to get an intervention or not. Um, and then a couple of comments from Chris Crandall, uh, the main tenor of which is that there are plenty of people doing this stuff and that we're like hyper-focused on the ex like in-lab experimentalists and we're actually overlooking the many behavioral scientists who are actually working to do field studies right now. So uh, I guess any thoughts on either of those? Yeah, I mean, that, that second uh, comment is, I'm sure is fair. I, I just, my book is about sort of the most successful social psychologists and what they've been selling. And, you know, it might just be that that less sexy work is less likely to get attention. Um, I didn't mean to imply that the whole field work tradition was like dead. It just doesn't seem like that's where the center of gravity is. Um, I'll let you guys take the how to sell partner organizations thing, except for to make one point. The point I try to make people like with uh, the IAT is like, if you actually care about this problem you want to solve, surely you do not want to spend money on approaches that don't work. And, and just because it feels like an approach will work and is smart. We have a million examples of, of that not being the case. If you guys have thoughts on the partner organization thing, that's not my field. I mean, I, I don't really have thoughts. That's what I'm sort of chiming in to say. I mean, I, I've been struggling with this. Like I teach a course to MBA students called managerial decision-making. Over time, 
more and more of that course is about scientific literacy, basically, because they need to be able to understand evidence in order to be able to make good evidence-based decisions. And just seeing, I mean, I, I give them, you know, they're not actually doing stats, they're not like reading regression tables, but I try to give them sort of an overview of how to interpret and understand scientific findings and the importance of random assignment and all this. And it's so clearly not enough. Like it's not even close to enough. And so I sort of feel like you need, I mean, like with the field partner, it's like, you just have to get lucky. If someone's like into this stuff, then, then they're into this stuff. Otherwise it's really hard to educate people about this. It almost feels like to me, there needs to be some kind of, we need to have this as a proper part Scientific literacy needs to be a proper part of everybody's education. Like statistics should be in high school. Um, and, but, but that's like not a very satisfying answer because that's like, yeah, that's, I don't, I, there's no quick fix for this, uh, for this kind of problem. I, I don't know, I really don't know what to do about it. That's my own pessimistic take. I just want to plug one book. Um, I read this. I found it useful. I'm, I'm curious if people better versed in the history uh, might have strong thoughts, but I, The Disappearance of the Social in American Social Psychology by John D. Greenwood, I, I would recommend for folks interested in that. Um, I, I read it when I thought more of the book was going to be about the history of social psych, but we just went in a different direction. So we only have like two minutes. So earlier you, you mentioned that you're sort of opti you're not very optimistic about the journalism side of science, but you're fairly optimistic about the the science part of science. Um, maybe it'd be good to end on on why you have optimism and what you think is going to uh, happen in the near term. Yeah, I, I just so so the chapter I read really was just a layperson overview. I didn't go that deep in the weeds, and some of the weeds uh, escape me statistically because my own limitations. But I just I get the sense you guys have a pretty good um, diagnosis of what went wrong and exactly how it went wrong. And most importantly, there's very specific guardrails you can put in place that seem likely to me to prevent some of these outcomes again. I mean, like. Uh, pre-registration. Uh, you, you've really put in ways to prevent people from sort of fishing through the data and just treating whatever uh, pops out as important. So I'm sure, I know there's some critiques of certain aspects of the open science movement, and then there's debates over, should we go Bayesian? Should we reduce sort of what uh, what p-value you need to, to meet the statistical significance threshold? So you guys have stuff to figure out, but I just... Um, Whereas in journalism, no one is like, yeah, here's how we're going to fix the funding model of journalism. It seems like psychology at least has taken the first steps to understanding why things went wrong. You guys are great is basically what I'm trying to say. That's, that's not what I was fishing for with that answer. But <laughs> that's a, I think that's a perfect way to end this. So uh, uh, thanks. Yeah. Dave. Um, yeah, go ahead, Leif. Take it from here. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, I, no, thanks. Uh, that is the perfect way to end it. And thanks, Jesse, so much for for coming to speak with us. And for all of you audience members who haven't yet read his book, The Quick Fix, it is still out there. He asked us to sell 10,000 copies. So buy early and buy often. Uh, and thanks to you all and Alexa for being here. Uh, all of your questions and comments, and there were lots, I'll make sure they get to Jesse so he can uh, mold them over over the weekend. Uh, and for the rest of you, uh, Data Claude is gonna take a little bit of time off because it's the end of the semester. Uh, enjoy your weekend and we'll be back soon. If Cheers. any of you guys have um, follow-up questions or anything, jesse.r.single at gmail.com. Always happy to hear from psychologists. Perfect. Thanks so much, Jesse. All Thank right. you guys. Thanks for having me. Bye.